Right, well, thank you very much. Um, welcome to this. This is my very first Zoom presentation. So uh, I apologise in advance if there are any issues. Um, I apologise also for the fact if you actually signed up for this talk thinking it was going to be a history of the Bronze Grove Guild and a review of places where you can see their work locally. Um, in retrospect, I think that was too big a job. And so basically what I've done is I've turned into one talk about the history of the Guild. And I'm more than happy to do a second talk on the where you can see the Guild's work in the, the close vicinity of Bromsgrove. That's if the Bromsgrove Society Local History Group would ever like to invite me back after tonight's or this afternoon's presentation. Right, so basically, I arrived, as Joe has just mentioned, in Bromsgrove in 1979. Before I came to Bromsgrove, the only thing I knew about the place was the fact that there were two railwaymen's graves in St John's Churchyard. Uh, but as soon as I came and started work at South Bromsgrove High School, and people learned I was a history teacher, what they were very keen to tell me was that the most famous thing that ever happened in Bromsgrove was the building of the, the gates of Buckingham Palace. And even though they didn't seem to know much else, apart from there had been some nailers in the town, uh, it was with a tremendous sense of pride, I think, that people had about um, the fact that these gates existed. Uh, for me personally, it was interesting because during my very first year in Bromsgrove, I lived at number 10 Guild Road. And if you don't know where Guild Road is, a bit later on, I shall show you a map, uh, which will pinpoint exactly where it was. It was right next to the Bromsgrove, one of the Bromsgrove Guild's premises. Now, as just mentioned, it can't, I, I can't believe myself that it is 20 years, over 20 years now since we produced the book, the book, uh, at that time, in the mid, I think it must have been the mid 1990s, the local history group was sitting around and we were deciding on a project that we could work on collectively. And there you can see the team who mainly produced the book Marlene Goodwin on the left hand side, Jenny Townsend, John Weston at the back next to Bill Kings, and Thelma Lamas on the right hand side. And we sat down and we thought, well, wonder why it is that nobody has ever written a history of the Bromsgrove Guild before. And we very quickly found out when we started to do our own research. Because what all historians of the Guild discover very rapidly is that there are very, very few documentary sources, original documentary sources um, accounts, lists of staff, transactions, all the kinds of material that you would normally look at when you're trying to write the history of a company. What you do find, and some of you will possibly know this, that if you go to the archives in Worcester or Hartlebury, you've got lots of boxes of photographs of commissions that they completed. But 99 times out of 100, you'll find that these photographs have no indication of where they were originally situated or who bought them. So basically, it's very, very difficult to pinpoint the story of the Guild. In fact, what you rely on is the original customers of the company actually having a record of the transactions. And more often than not, that's where we got the information. So essentially, what I'm going to do this afternoon is based on the hard work of everybody you can see in that photograph. So I'm just a spokesperson for all those people who were there. Now, there was one main written source which existed when we began our work. And that was a chapter in the bygone Bromsgrove history book, which I think was the very first one that was produced by the Bromsgrove Society. And here you can see the quotation from Robert Pankeri. Now, Bob Pankeri was the son of one of the original guild workers. 
and we'll talk a bit about his views in a moment but his interpretation here as you can see he pinpoints the year 1907 as if you like the peak of the guild's success and thereafter after that apogee it's rocket like ascent then we see a scintillating decline now i hate to argue with an eyewitness to history and he was if not there at the time he at least spoke to people who had been there at the time i would tend to think actually the first world war is more of the high water mark in the story of the bromsgrove guild and thereafter i would say there was a bit of a plateau and i would say the plateau would go throughout most of the 1920s and if you like the the descent the decline really begins with the the onset of the great depression in the 1930s and i think if the guild was on the way out from that moment onwards the uh, second world war delivered the coup de gras uh, in terms of the company so i'm going to take you on a journey through that nice raw iron gate that you can see there and we're going to look at the story of the bromsgrove guild now basically the story of the bromsgrove guild relies on at least in the early days three key figures and this guy here who you can see walter henry gilbert he if you like is the central character in the story of the bromsgrove guild he originated from rugby in warwickshire and in february 1898 he was appointed as the head of art at the bromsgrove school of art it must have been at the time when he was appointed that part of his brief was not only to teach art and lead the art department but also to create a if you like a commercial arm to the business or to the art department he would be a bit like the head of art at south bromsgrove high school today being expected to do a bit of painting and decorating at the weekend to raise money for the school now the guild therefore began its work we reckon towards the end of 1898 and into the spring of 1899 so that if you like is the first key date 1898-99 according to bob pankeri walter gilbert was and i quote temperamental vain capricious opinionated argumentative and a dreadful dandy so you can see he had a very high opinion of him um trying to be a, the balanced historian that i am i would tend to say well if those are the kind of negative characteristics of the guy he must have been a very dynamic and charismatic leader as well um, to offset those negative observations really if you like the key period the most successful period of the guild is when he was there and he left the bromsgrove guild in 1918. he seems to have worked with the guild for the first four or five years after that but there were disputes in the early 1920s which led to a complete breach with the bromsgrove guild he left bromsgrove and went to work for a company called martins in cheltenham so here you've got this charismatic but temperamental artistic leader his right hand man on the artistic front was this chap this is louis weingartner now louis weingartner was a swiss a swiss national art worker and by 1900 early 1900s he was based in london with another guy who worked for the guild called joseph hurdle weingartner was encouraged to move to bromsgrove round about 1904 even though he'd completed work for the guild before then and he was a master of what might one might call exquisite design work in a variety of different media we'll see some of that in a moment a few years after walter gilbert left the guild weingartner followed him to martins in 1921 
Um, the poor chap eventually met his end in Lucerne in 1934 as a result of an accident involving a tram. Um, so that was a tr personal tragedy for the Weingartner family. And if Bill Kings were still here, he would proudly tell you that he lived in Weingartner's old house on the Stourbridge Road in Bromsgrove. Now here you've got two artists, but in order to get these artists organized in a, a business-like fashion, you needed someone with a lot of business or financial nous. And that was provided by this gentleman here, William Leslie McCandlish. McCandlish was from Edinburgh and he was the West of England secretary of the Scottish Widows Assurance Company based in Bristol. Of course, Scottish Widows still exist today. And to show how, if you like, how perceptive or how adroit in a financial front this guy was, he chose his wife, a lady called Millicent Fry. And Millicent Fry was a member of the Fry's chocolate family. How he got brought into the Bromsgrove Guild, we don't know for sure, but he first is mentioned in the accounts in 1905. And he becomes a partner with Walter Gilbert. So as well as being the financial brains of the society, or the company, right the way up to his own death in 1947, he, when he spoke to people who could remember the Guild, they said he would often appear on site anywhere in the UK to check up that the workers were actually getting on with doing the job. Now, if 1898 was the beginnings of the Bromsgrove Guild, its breakthrough moment happened a few years later in this particular building here. This is a Jacobean mansion house and in this particular case, this has been redesigned by Sir Edwin Lutyens. But this building is nowhere in England. This is where it was. In 1900, the exposition Universelle took place. It was the second, I think, first in 1899, 1889, where the Eiffel Tower, which you can see in the distance there, was erected. And it was in this particular building, the British Pavilion, or the Royal Pavilion as it was called, that a whole range of British art workers exhibited their work along with some great traditional British art. And because the Bromsgrove Guild is starting to make a name for itself, particularly in, in the medium of what, what, what might be called arts and crafts, it was given, uh, a bedroom at the back of the building to decorate in arts and crafts style and that got a lot of attention a lot of publicity at the time a lot of credit and if you like was the breakthrough moment in the story of the bronze road guild now here you've got an advertisement which must date from pretty soon after the Paris ex exhibition. Because if you look at the top of the, the screen, you will see their lists, some of them awards and honorable mentions that the company received. But what I like about this particular document is on the left hand side, it lists all the different kinds of artwork that the, that the business was involved in in those days. And you can see there's a tremendous variety of different activities. Over the years, many of those fell away. And of course, probably many of you will think primarily in terms of metalwork and maybe stained glass windows as being preeminently Bromsgrove Grove Guild work. And on the right, of course, you've got a, a who's who of arts and crafts artists of the early Edwardian period. You've got George Bankart, for example, there, uh, who was the, the, ch the chief guy in the plaster department. And you've got Walter Gilbert mentioned as, as well. Arthur and Georgina Gaskin, Hurdle, who I mentioned a moment ago, and 
there you've got a guy called Henry Payne. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was, oh, anyway, before we go on to that one, yeah, there's another picture there from the time, from the soon after the Paris exhibition. And there you've got what I think is interesting. They didn't even know what to call themselves at the time, because in some documents they're the Bronze Road Guild of the Applied Arts, and then sometimes just the Bronze Road Guild as an association of artists. And the reason why I put this particular picture on here is because this picture is an embroidery. And this was actually in the Bronze Road Guild bedroom, as it was called, in the rear of the British Pavilion, the House of Holiness. No, this is uh, Henry Payne. When I was at, uh, well, as, as a very young child, I can remember seeing this picture in an encyclopedia somewhere, depicting the beginnings of the Wars of the Roses. And I never knew, I never thought, realised I'd come back to this picture via the Bronze Road Guild route much, much later. This is actually a mural. Uh, it's not actually a, a, a painting on a wall. It's a, a mural actually in the Palace of Westminster. Now, I've been on a couple of tours, like many of you probably have, around Parliament, but I've never seen the, the corridor where this painting actually exists. But Henry Payne, by the time he gets about 1904, 1905, he's no longer associated with the, with the Guild anymore. And I think it's perhaps important to mention there the way the, this business actually operated. It wasn't a company. People weren't paid on the books. Craftsmen and artists were brought in by Walter Gilbert using his contacts with, say, the Birmingham Guild and other artists in the Midlands and even as far as London would come in and do a particular job and then go off and continue with their own private work. And Henry Payne would have been just one of those kind of guys. One of the most celebrated thing that Walter Gilbert managed to do was to call together or group together foreign craftsmen to come and work in Bromes Road. And this nice team photograph We've been able to identify most of the characters, but there's a, there are two we're not sure about. And if anybody listening now knows who they might be, please let me know. But this team of workers, at the back there, hiding, you've got Louis Weingartner, who we've already seen. But here on the left, we've got a chap called Henri Pilon. Now, Pilon was from Tours in France. He was an art plaster caster and moulder. And he left the Guild in 1921, probably at the same time as Weingartner. And he also went to work at Martins in Cheltenham. But interestingly for Pion, by the time of the 1939 register, he was back in Bromsgrove. And he was actually living at a place called Charford Lodge in Charford Road. And if you look on the map, Charford Lodge is directly opposite the entrance to South Bromsgrove High School. Over here on the right, you've got a guy called Charles Bonnet. Now, he was from Barcelona. He was a modeler. He lasted until the 1920s as well. But he left to go to New York in America, where he worked. You're going to see one of his pieces later on. He designed the statue of Hygieia, and we're going to see Hygieia later. This little fella at the front, Garcia, we know nothing about him at all, except he was a Spanish pointer, and he's believed to have committed suicide in the mill pond at Moat Mill, which is at the end of Charford Road, near where the bungalows are on the corner of Worcester Road. On the extreme right, we've got Celestino Pancheri. He was a wood carver and he originated from the South Tyrol, which in those days was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, famously, he came to Bromsgrove as a result of seeing an advertisement in Paris Soir magazine placed by Walter Gilbert, who was looking for foreign trained wood carvers. He lasted with the Guild till 1926. 
obviously I suspect the negative views his son had about Walter Gilbert possibly came from him. Um, and he eventually set up his own wood carving business in Aston Fields with a guy called Hack, A-E-W Hack. And I suspect in the whole of North Worcestershire, there won't be a church which hasn't got some wood carving completed by Pankeri. Now, on the left, between Pion and Weingartner, we got Leopold Weiss. He joined the guild in 1905, and it originally came from Budapest. He, was, he's work, he worked in wood and plaster, and you can see some of his work in the ceiling of Dodford Church. But sadly for this guy, the reason why he's remembered most is because he died en route to Canada in 1912 when him and his wife sailed in the Titanic. Not a good move. One other guy who might be in the picture, but I'm not sure, is Joseph Hurdle himself. He's not pictured, I don't think. He was also Swiss and a friend of Weingartner, a partner of Weingartner. In both 1901 and 1911 in the censuses, he's listed as living in Bromsgrove at Whitford, Whitford Vale in Bromsgrove, which is a, probably a house very close to the crossroads on the Kidderminster Road and Whitford Road. I'm not sure if that building still exists. I know there's a school there or used to be a school there. It may be very close to that. So those are the foreign workers. Where are we looking at? Okay, so the, the guild was sited in a number of places in the Bromsgrove area. Moat Mill down at Charford was with wood woodwork shop. The lead work was done at the Tardybig. But the most first and most important building was on the north side of Station Street here. And that was what was called Melbourne House. That was the very first workshop. But not long after McCandlish arrived, the Guild bought the land on the other side of the road, which you can see marked in this 1926 map. They expanded there, and that became their main metal workshop. And Guild Road, where I used to live, is this little road that goes along here, there, and that's the house I lived in when I first came to Bronze Road. Now imagine you're looking at this view from St John's Church looking across in a kind of southeasterly direction. There you go, that's a view of the Bromsgrove Guild. So there you've got Melbourne House there, now surrounded by the new development, and there's the, the building bought with land, the money in 1908 from McCandlish. So that's actually the, the headquarters of the Guild. And now Let's go back over there and look towards the church. There you go. And there you can see the church in the distance St John's. There's Melbourne House. And there is a building which many of you who have lived in Bromsgrove a long time will remember. When I first came to Bromsgrove, people used to tell me that was where they made the liver birds because they needed a big building to make the liver birds. When actually it was the stained glass windows workshop not long before it was demolished, those of us who worked on the book went in there one day, probably highly illegally, don't tell anybody, um, and we took some photographs, and it was right, right inside, it was rather like an old textile mill with these long rows of windows that you can see for the light. Now then, this is, as far as I know, the only photograph we've got of the inside of the workshop, the main workshop on Station Street. It's a lovely photograph. And if you can see, the men there are actually making what one might call the basic bread and butter kind of work that the Guild created. Because if you see here, they're actually working on fireplaces, car, raw time fireplaces. At this time, once again, we, we can't be 100% sure, but we've seen references to there being about 150 people working for the Bromsgrove Guild in that period just before the First World War. And one of my favorite features of this particular photograph, 
is the pop bottle at the front with the marble in it. Now then, when we talk about the, the work of Louis Weingartner, this will be the kind of thing that he would have done brilliantly well. In the days when big public buildings were being opened or parts, new parts of buildings, often they would have a ceremonial trowel created to, for the laying of the first stone. And as you can see, this one here was pr produced for the building or extension to Bart's Hospital in London. I imagine Weingartner was the guy who probably created that. And then once again, when you look at these adverts, and this one's from 1904, they're still listing a, a kind of fairly wide range of different products that the Bronze Grove Guild was involved in making. This is, we believe, another picture of Pankeri, Celestino Pankeri, with a working on some wood carving there behind him. And the kind of thing which, oh, and I said a moment ago, that you're likely to see in churches, particularly in the North Worcestershire area, are lecterns like this one here. Now, once again, you've got a problem because some of them may have been built or made when he was working on his own or with Mr. Hack in Aston Field rather than working for the Bromes Road Guild. This one, you can tell, comes from the the archives with a in, with a reference number on it in the collection of Bromsgrove Road Guild materials but it doesn't say on the back where exactly it went I think I do know where it ended up but unfortunately they're not they're not noted a lot of the time now then we've had 1898 the start we've had 1900 the breakthrough moment when did the, the business really begin to take off? Well, it was as a result of work on this building here. This is a photograph, very early photograph of Buckingham Palace. Um, as you can see, this is about 40 years before the Bromsgrove Guild did their work there. When you see these older pictures of, the, of Buckingham Palace, it's so very different on the right what we now see is the Queen Victoria Memorial and the Mall going up to Trafalgar Square. All of that was completely redesigned in the 1900s by an architect called Aston Webb. And as part of that redesign, they were going to put new gates and railings at the front of Buckingham Palace. And the Bromsgrove Guild famously got the job of producing those gates. The question is, why? And we've got no official documentary evidence to suggest why they got it, but my assumption and suspicion is it links to this particular gentleman here. And with a name like that, most of you from the Bromsgrove area will know exactly who he was. Um, the first Earl of Plymouth, Robert Windsor Clive. He was the Minister of Works in the Conservative government of Balfour, Arthur Balfour, 1902 to 1905. Um, the government which ended with the great liberal landslide election victory. Now, one of the things he managed to do before that electoral defeat was get the, help get the Bromsgrove Guild, I suspect, the job of producing the gates for Buckingham Palace. And they're in situ. If you've been down to see them, you'll know what they look like. In glorious technicolor detail. Um, splendid piece of work. And famously as well, though not always on display, you've got the locks and the lock mechanism and the cherubs. Now the cherubs are detachable. Um, they have to be because some of the original ones were stolen in the 1970s and had to be remade. And the cherubs only tend to come out when it's special occasions. But what's interesting about this particular piece of work is that whereas the Bromsgrove Guild more often than not didn't even write their own name on the work that they created, if you go down to Buckingham Palace and have a look at the little labels underneath, 
it does say not only Bromsgrove Guild, Worcestershire, but it even mentions the name of Walter Gilbert and Louis Weingartner. So they were particularly keen to make sure that their names were publicised. Now, this photograph was taken in January 8, 1995, which must have been about the time we first started to actually do the work on the Bronze Road Grill book. This was at a time when the Queen Victoria Memorial was still being used as a roundabout. And I think somebody lost control of the car and it went flying into the gates. Allegedly, though nobody's ever been able to confirm this, Allegedly, somebody from Buckingham Palace made contact with Bromsgrove Council to ask if the Bromsgrove Guild could help repair the gates. Unfortunately, the Bromsgrove Guild had been defunct for 30 years by the time of this particular event. But in the whole area of the Mall, I must admit that my favourite piece of the Guild work are these gates here, the Great Gates of Canada, uh, which lead into Green Park. You can see the name Canada on the stone there. And um, you've got little symbols for each of the different states in Canada. It's a beautiful piece of work. Now, staying in London, next time you're in London, you can go down and have a look at this. You've got other work connected to the Royals. This is the new extension to the British Museum, which was unveiled by King George V in 1912. And the Guild created the lift here, the lift enclosure in bronze and glass. And also they did the railings, the hand railings going down the stairs. So I think these ones aren't the completed fi finished version of those. They look a bit rough to me. So next time you go to the British Museum, have a look at the stairways and the lift, and you can see the work of the Bromsgrove Guild. Always with a good commercial eye to the main chance, uh, the Bromsgrove Guild also capitalised on events like the beatification of Joan of Arc by the Pope in 1909, when they produced a whole series of these figurines of St. Joan. Um, some of them were in bronze and some of them were in a kind of a, a material called ivorine, which obviously is a, a I don't think it was actually ivory. It was obviously made to look like it was ivory. And of course, there's a differential in prices in terms of the size and whether you had a metal one or an ivory version. Well, one of my favorite pieces of work that the Guild did, which I've mentioned earlier, were the liver birds. Now it's interesting, and those of you from Bromsworth have probably noticed this, that whenever there's a, a news item, on the television about Liverpool, they invariably show you that particular building, the Royal Liver Assurance Building, and the Liver Birds at the top there. Now, this clip from the newspaper at the time they were erected in 1911 shows you that when they first put up there, they were not attached to the top of the building by these guy lines. Obviously, they didn't anticipate the effect of the wind blowing up the Mersey, what it would have on the actual birds themselves f wobbling around. And the other thing that's different is the fact that when they were first erected, the liver birds were not this verdigris green colour. They were covered in gold leaf. And over the years, that gold leaf was all blown away. Now, it's interesting that I once read the novel, The Cruel Sea by Nicholas Montserrat. And he refers to the fact that when the Corvette, his hero was on, captain of, I think he was a captain, came home to port, it was Liverpool, and they always knew they were getting close to Liverpool because they could see the gold of the liver bird shining in the distance. I don't know whether that was artistic license or whether there was still gold on them at the time of the Second World War. But one of the few bits of correspondence about the guild we have it relates to the uh, putting these guy lines in after the second world war the royal liver assurance company made contact with the guild and said we need somebody to secure these they're wobbling around 
would any of your men please come up and do it? And the, uh, the man who was chairman of the company at the time got back to say there was nobody there who was young enough or brave enough anymore to do such kind of work. So I don't know who actually got the job of securing the liver birds in situ. In that period though, I imagine most of the work or most of the money the company was making or the business was making, should I say, was from much smaller scale products like this garden statuary. Now, as a consequence of the Palace Gates Commission, that's when the Bromsgrove Guild was given the Royal Commission, the Royal Warrant. But as for where this picture was taken, we don't know. We can see if I looking at the stanchions on the outside of the picture there, it looks like some kind of a temporary building, like a big uh, marquee somewhere. It could be a, a garden festival or something, or maybe the 1908 Anglo-French festival. We're not sure. But what's interesting is it's promoting this garden statuary. And obviously these products continued quite a long time because if you look at this particular advert, you can see dated at the bottom, it says May 1926. Now I like this little chap. You're gonna see him again in a minute with his little butterfly landing on his arm there. And you could, you could instead, you could have bought this fella here with a lizard on his knee. Or you might prefer a piping fawn figure. Or perhaps somebody struggling with a fish. Now what I like about these three pictures here is you can see they were all taken on exactly the same plinth. But, and, yeah, and this is the other thing to mention about the guild's work. These were not one-offs. Basically, there were mo probably multiple copies of these different statues produced. And if you wanted to buy one of these pieces, where you would go to is Ednor Lane in Bromsgrove, just along from where the old cottage hospital used to be and where is now the Naylor's Court flats. And there you can see St John's Church in the, in the background there in the distance. And there you can see on display a whole range of garden work, which you could go along and say, I'd like one of those. I would like to direct your attention to that planter which is situated just over there because I'm going to take you another look at it in more detail. There it is. And what you can see very very clearly in this picture is the minute attention to detail which you would get in Bromsgrove Guild work. And in order to get animals in particularly accurately depicted it was said that the, the company actually maintained a small menagerie of wild animals so that they could be drawn from life or created from life as and when the need arose. Now, let's just say you bought that planter and it was delivered to your house in a nice wooden crate. On the outside of the crate would be one of these. This is only about, I would say, two or three inches across. And it's a bit like a, a trademark that would come with the paperwork. You can see the name of the comp name of the business at the bottom now. And nowadays, these are little regarded as little works of art in their own right. But at the time, they would have been regarded as fairly disposable items. But even so, the attention to detail, you can see there is quite strong. In terms of big pieces of work, this is a, a nice photograph taken inside the studio of a big fountain group called Bacchus and Nymphs, which was built for a, a big mansion house in Warwickshire, Morton Paddocks. I like these pictures because I like to look at what you can see behind the pictures as much as anything else. Now this is that statue completed, that is the fountain group in place at Morton, Maddock, Morton Paddocks. It's not there anymore. Um, where it's gone is a mystery. We don't know for sure where it's disappeared to. But what's interesting about this, this group is that the owner of a, a property nearby 
decided that he too would like some Bromsgrove Gill work in his garden. And he ordered this piece of work, which is goes under a variety of names, but on the back is called, in this case, Diana and the Loves, dated about 1908. Once again, if you look to the right of the picture, you can see there, there's a little lad with a butterfly on his arm, or a version of him, and other bits and pieces in the, in the workshop. In situ, this is what it is today, and it is still there. You can still go and have a look at this, because Morton Hall is actually part of uh, Agricultural College. As I recall, it's between Leamington Spa, over the Leamington Spa, Stratford on Avon Way. And I remember going there to take this particular picture in the run up to when the book came out in 1999. But interestingly, you can see there that the lead is starting to come apart on that little cherub. I don't know whether they have, have mended that in the last 20 years or so. This piece of work is one of the last big jobs they did before the First World War. Um, and it was sent across the United States of America to Philadelphia for the home of Mr. Albert Johnson, who is president of the Baldwin Locomotive Works. Now, when the book came out, I didn't know anything about the Baldwin Locomotive Works. But now I know that the Baldwin Locomotive Works produce lots of steam locomotives, including for the Trans-Siberian Railway, if you're interested. Um, this piece of work had a very narrow escape from destruction. About 30 to 40 years ago, it was gonna be melted down for scrap value, but was rescued and has now been moved to Kansas City, Missouri where in the center of the town, they've got like an open air art gallery and it's one of the prime exhibits in that area. Now we're up to about the First World War. Now remember I said, I thought that was more the peak rather than 1907. And that's why I've got a series of World War I related pictures here. The Lusitania, famous Cunard liner, sunk by the German Navy in 1915. Well, it was launched about 10 years before and the Bromsgrove Guild did a lot of work, 10,000 pounds worth of work on the Lusitania, which was an astronomical sum in those days. They did metal work, as well as the, probably in this picture, the plaster work you can see here and maybe even the, the stained glass as well. This is a smoking room on the Lusitania. The Part which I'm always most attracted to is the lift enclosure, which was made in bronze and glass, and all the balustrading and the stairways, they will have produced all that metalwork as well, none of which you can see anymore because it's all at the bottom of the Irish Sea. Terrible shame. But some of the other ships that the Guild did jobs on um, are interesting as well. The very first line that they did work on was the Moldavia. Once again, sunk by the Germans in 1918. Uh, they, on this particular one, they did ornamental balustrading and iron with bronze enrichments. This ship here, the Orvieto, 1909. On this particular one, they did stained glass and a variety of metal work. And finally, the Arama, launched 1911. Once again, it was sunk. Uh, they did plaster work. Glass to work on the ceiling, stained glass, wood and metal work as well. So in that period running up to the Great War, the Bromsgrove Yield did quite a lot of work for the different shipping companies. Now, in terms of the, the most famous shipping disaster ever, which we've mentioned earlier on, in 1912, when the Titanic disaster occurred, um, Wallace Hartley, the band leader, was one of the few people whose body was actually recovered. I reckon about 335 bodies were actually recovered after the Titanic disaster. And Hartley, as one of those, actually had a, a proper funeral in his hometown, which was Colne in Lancashire, which happened in May 1912, which you can see here. So you can actually visit his grave. 
that the people of Colm decided that they wanted to erect a memorial to him and a public fund was set up to raise fund money to do that and essentially this was the consequence this was the result of it so this is what you see if you go to Colm today to take a photograph so not only do you have the band leader at the top but on the shoulders of the plinth you've got music on the one side this figure represents music and the other one is valor but sadly those two figures are not the originals because they too like the cherubs at buckingham palace were stolen at one point in the past and had to be redesigned by another artist not the bronze guild because it no longer existed at the time now there's a bit of a, a breather for a moment there's an, another example of the kind of work that they did electrical works electroliers electrical chandeliers and you can read this for yourself extract from the famous poem by john betjeman So I think this is the high point of the Bromsgrove Road Guild round about the time of the First World War. Thereafter, they're making their money from domestic appliances like this one here. And some for what I imagine was probably more of a hotel rather than a domestic situation, fireplace. This one's an interesting one because on the back it's got some written details which tell you something about the actual product the size of it gives you some idea of the scale you can see the delicacy and the attention to detail here of the the molding but you've also got a price 37 pound 10 shillings now some years ago i tried to i used one of those online calculators to work out what that would be in modern money now 1100 quid seems like a lot of money to me but maybe that's what it would be in its equivalence and you've also got Hygieia. I mentioned earlier on that Charles Bonnet, he designed or modelled this figure. Uh, whether, and people have said that the way that the, the fabric, the cloth, the appearance of the cloth falling down over is utterly realistic. Once again, this figure, many would have been made. Uh, I've, I've tracked down at least one other one to a, a big house in near Cheltenham. But we got some details about her as well. Height six foot, and in lead, 150 quid. In granite stucco, 50 pounds. So you can see there's a differential. Now she's a, a granite stucco version, but you can see a lead version here. And this famous lead version is in front of a very famous property in Buckinghamshire, Checkers or Chequers Court, as it was called at the time, Lord Lee of Fareham actually donated or bequeathed the estate to the country to the, as a, a residence, country residence for the serving British Prime Minister in 1917, obviously trying to avoid death duties or some other form of taxation. And here is the very, very first Prime Minister who ever stayed at Chequers. And he's standing right next to our statue of Hygieia. And that, of course, is Worcestershire's own Stanley Baldwin. And with the Stanley Baldwin theme in mind, I'm sure he probably was aware of the existence of the Bronze Road Guild. He certainly would have been in 1925 when he received this ornamental casket, which was presented to him when he became a free man of the borough of Bewdley. And once again, that's a beautiful piece of work. And it shows you the range of different craftspeople who are still working for the Guild in the 1920s. The Guild made a lot of money from war memorials, um, domestic war memorials. But this one isn't domestic. If you can read it, you might have just seen that this one is actually on the wall of the town hall 
in the city, Belgian city of Mons, which is where the British Expeditionary Force first saw action in August 1914, and by a remarkable coincidence, was recaptured by the Canadian Division on the 11th of November 1918, the day the war came to a conclusion. Uh, this is it just inside the entrance to the town hall. On the outside is a very famous bronze monkey on the wall. Not a brass monkey, I think, but a bronze monkey, which people rub the head of as a good luck technique. Now, people often say to me, well, how do you know that that is Bromsgrove Guild? Because it doesn't actually say Bromsgrove Guild anywhere on it. But if I could just demonstrate to you from this trades journal from the 1920s, there you can actually see the name of the company and the very same memorial in place. So that helps us track down and confirm whether something was guild or not. Now into the 1920s, you've got Walter Gilbert, Weingartner, those guys have all gone now. The chief modeler from in the 20s and the 30s was a gentleman on the right, Michael Hugh and Crichton, usually referred to as Hugh and Crichton. He was chief modeler from 1919 to 1937. In 1937, he was, I suppose, in current parlance, he was furloughed um, because the company couldn't afford to pay him anymore and he went back home to live in Edinburgh. But that didn't mean to say he didn't keep doing jobs for the Bromsgrove Guild. He was called in from time to time to do pieces of work. Now, one of my favourite pieces of work that Crichton produced was in 1924, and it was this piece here. I won't tell you why it's my favourite. Um, Terpsichore, or Terpsichore. She was produced for the Fortune Theatre in London. Virtually life-size model. Difficult to see her today, because that's where she is, on the wall outside of the theatre. Um, She's been up there a long, long time, and almost as long as I think the woman in black has been playing at that theatre. So she's a, 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 a remarkable piece. The, the actual Fortune Theatre today don't believe she is called Terpsichore. They actually call her Fortuna. So there's a bit of a, de a debate about what her real name is. But whilst you're in London, you might want to go to Millbank, just along from the Palace of Westminster and look at the ICI doors, the old ICI headquarters with its doors. Each of these leaves of the doors here weighs two and a half tons and has to be opened by a motor. But they're made of a product called silveroid, but embedded in each silveroid door, you've got these three dimensional panels showing different scenes from science and progress. And this one at the bottom, which you can access most easily, shows you Michael Faraday giving a lecture at the Royal Society. And you've got some famous other Victorian scientists on the front row. Darwin there, for example. Some of you might recognise some of these other people. But inside the building, originally, was, I think, this quite remarkable piece of work made in this silveroid substance. It was called a kind of an alloy. This thing was four foot six by three foot six, which I think is a really impressive piece of 1920s art. Where it is now, who knows? On the wall of some rich executive's house, no doubt. So, end of the 1920s, I think this is the time when things start to go wrong for the Guild. It was, you got the war, the First World War, you got the de economic depression which occurred after the First World War. They weren't getting the big jobs that they'd formerly got before 1914. And then to cap it all off, you got the Wall Street crash in 1929 and the onset of the Great Depression. A lot of the workers would have been put off and they relied on jobs which were few and far between to keep the, the workforce together. Now, this is one of their most important jobs in the early 1920s, not actually building Twickenham Bridge, which is what this picture shows you, 
were put adding to Twickenham Bridge, which is what it was like completed. The railings, which go all the way along both sides of the, the roadway here. Take you down to ground level, and there you've got the side of the riverbank. You see the River Thames underneath there. And there you've got the railings coming down and all the way across and the light fittings as well. They reckon this job kept the workforce together during that particular bad time. This was opened by the Prince of Wales um, in 1933. There's a nice picture of a nighttime view. Now, one of the last pieces of work which the Guild did, uh, and I think probably one of the last pieces of work that Hugh and Crichton ever made for the Guild, was this statue on, with this pl uh, plaque commemorating the centenary of the birth of that great cricketer, W.G. Grace, at the Gloucestershire County Ground in Bristol. And that guy there is the Duke of Beaufort, who's unveiling it. Not particularly clear picture of what it actually looks like close up. But Crichton produced this, even though it was more than 10 years after he'd been sent back to Edinburgh or living in Edinburgh, but he would be called in to do these jobs. By this time, the company really was starting to run on a skeleton crew. And in the final years, this man here, George Hewell, was the guy who was acting as chairman after the death of McCandlish in 1947. This gentleman here worked his way up I and mean, joined the Guild in 1910. He was not an artist, he was very much a, a bureaucrat, did all the kind of backroom jobs. And essentially in the 50s and the early 1960s, he was there basically farming out jobs, commissions to sublet, subletting commissions to other businesses with similar skills to the Bromsgrove Guild. Uh, there was hardly anybody here in Bromsgrove anymore doing their work. This gentleman here is also the one of the main reasons why there are so few documentary sources telling you the story of the Bromsgrove Guild, because evidently he had a lot of it destroyed in 1966 when the company went into liquidation. Now then, if you're interested, this is a view of the area between Bromsgrove at the bottom and where I am at the moment, which is in Wolverhampton. And there you've got listed a whole series of places where there are bits of work by the Bromsgrove Guild that you can see. There are probably many others, but many of these places shown are where if you attend my other talk on the Bromsgrove Guild in the black country and its green borderlands, I can show you examples of their work nearby, that one day when lockdown is over and you're keen to get out and about, you can go and look at and admire for yourself. And with that, we come to the end of the talk. Thank you very much for listening. I hope it was some interest to you. And we can now go over to any questions and I will stop the share and hand back to Mike, who will now, now 